Glad you're at chapel. This is our last chapel of the year. What a fabulous year of chapel it's been. Thanks for coming every week. Prepared to grow. Let's open with a word of prayer. To your seats, please. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this season of school. We thank you, Lord, for this school year. We thank you for all that you've done, your goodness to each of us and to our school community. And especially we give thanks, Lord, for this chapel program and the light that you've brought and the truth that you've brought. And today as we celebrate this final chapel, Lord, we ask for your continued blessing. We thank you. Bless our speaker today and, and Lord, the time we have together in worship as well. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. What's going on, everyone? Will you please, for the last time, stand and join us in worship?
In Hebrews 4.16, it says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And what, what sticks out to me about this verse, or these two words, it says, with confidence, because we can draw near to the throne of God with confidence, because he invites us in. And it's not just an invitation. He wants us to come and lay down our burdens at his feet, because he's going to carry them for us. And he doesn't just lift our burdens off of us he lifts us up and he dusts us off and everything that broke inside of you when you were doing it all alone he restores because god loves you and he's waiting for you to come lay it all at his feet and so i just want to want everyone to meditate on that as we sing this song Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. I'll sing this out. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ.
God, I just want to thank you, Lord, because you're so good. And I thank you, God, because you do invite us in. And you don't just invite, you take everything that worries us and you carry it yourself. And I just pray, Lord, that you would fill this room with your presence, God. And I pray that you would make every single person in this room feel loved. And I pray, Lord, that we would be blessed by what the speaker asked for us today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, I want to say that our chapel theme this year of truth has been such a powerful gift to us us each day, remembering that um, the truth of Scripture is true yesterday, today, and forever. A concept, a word that goes uh, throughout the Scriptures associated with truth is honor. And uh, that's what we've been doing together, worshiping our Lord and honoring Uh, the sacrifice of the Son. And I just want to say what a blessing it's been to have our students and others, members of the Shadow Mountain team, lead us in worship throughout this school year, and we're looking forward to that again next year. I also want to say uh, we need to continue to honor the guests that we have, and today we're blessed with someone who has a message for us out of the book of Romans, and we're very pleased to introduce uh, Mr. Ken Bevel. Ken may be recognized by many of you. Ken has acted in several movies, one being Courageous, another being Fireproof. He did so after retiring from a career in the Marine Corps, and he now serves as an associate pastor at a church called Sherwood Baptist Church in Albany, Georgia. Let's honor our guest this morning, Ken Bevel. Good morning, everybody. Last chapel of the year, huh? 14 more days of school till summer? Something like that. Hey, let's give the Lord a hand for that, right? (laughs) That's right. (laughs) I tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, I am so grateful to be here with you today, and uh, I'm grateful to be back in California. I used to live here for about two years, a couple years ago, and uh, I just imagine all the anxiety of coming back to California. The driving is like crazy here. Prices are like out of the roof. Pulling up to the gas station, $6 a gallon for gas. Blew me away. Went to Chick-fil-A. Thought I'd get a break at Chick-fil-A. Not even a break there. 16 bucks for a number one. I was like, this is crazy. But you know what? I start thinking about all those things, and I start thinking about sometimes how looking at all those different things can bring different types of pressure on your life. Is that right? Somebody just say, yeah. All of these different types of things, and I think about you guys, and you've got two more weeks to go, but I also think about the pressures that you have on your life, just the expectations of parents. Expectations. You know, your father did this, and he was an athlete, and he did this, and she did this, and so you're expected to go in this different direction. Or you may have an expectation or a anxiety with relationships. You're like, man, I want to really be this person, but they're pushing me to be this person, and so this, this anxiety comes with these relationships. Uncertainty. You look at this uncertainty. What's going to happen next year? Am I ever going to come back and be with my friends and... Am I going to graduate with my friends? Am I going to be able to play sports next year? What, what about this? And then lastly, something that's not even on the screen is, is just image. you got this image that you're trying to portray, and, and this doesn't just stop with young people. Man, this is older people too. And when I look at adults, I start seeing their anxieties and where their issues and their pressures of life come from. I start looking at their health issues, responsibilities, rising costs relationships. And just as I thought about this today, I just thought about this balloon. And as you take this balloon and you blow it up, and you just think about life, I think about all the things that's going on, and it's just like this. It's like things are just coming in every day, and it's just like pressure. It's like, man, am I going to get through life? It's just like everything is just like coming in around you. Most of y'all are looking like, man, is it going to pop that or what? But you know what? That's how life is. It's like everything in life is just coming in around you, 
and you're like, man, am I going to be able to make it today? Am I going to be able to handle it today? It's just this pressure. And so many of you remember me from the movies, but I want to share with you how my life began. Not only how my life began, but just all of the pressure that came down on me to perform, to be somebody I wasn't, it was just crazy. So I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. I love Jacksonville. Matter of fact, you're executive pastors from Jacksonville too, so Duval, that's where I'm from. And uh, man, I love my life. I was a poor kid. Matter of fact, you see my little Easter picture up there. That's me in K-5. That's my Easter suit. And so that's where I lived at. That's my house. Not much of a house, a little shotgun house. Go and see straight from the front door through the back door. And so I grew up in some humble beginnings. But guess what? I was poor and I didn't know it. And, and so life was really, really good. And so I lived in one of those neighborhoods back in the South where my dad would go off to the steel mill to work and and then he would come home, and I'd see him running down the street, and I'd run, run down the street and then jump in his arms. It's great. I could smell people cooking, and we'd get out in the street, and we'd have these softball. I mean, it was just like incredible. But soon my life began to change. The pressures of life started coming in. You see, my dad working at this steel mill, he started getting these pressures. And because he wasn't a Christian, he didn't know how to handle these pressures, so he started drinking. He went from drinking to marijuana, and from marijuana to cocaine, and from cocaine to crack cocaine. And my dad's life started drifting very, very far off course. More pressure. As a young boy, I saw this happening, and I was very disturbed. You see, because every young boy needs a man who can tell him and show him, affirm him, help him. And when my dad wasn't there, I went to the streets. There were people that I knew out in the streets, and although they weren't doing the right thing, it kind of helped me. It protected me. And so there was more, this pressure to perform, to be this person I wasn't, just more pressure and so I did it. In high school, I started doing a lot of things I wasn't supposed to do and hanging out with a lot of people that I wasn't supposed to hang out with. And at 17 years of age, I knew I was going to be dead in jail or on drugs. I knew that was going to happen to me. And so at 17 years old, I made a decision. I said, I'm going to join the Marine Corps. Hoorah. How many people's parents are in the Marine Corps? Okay, I got a few here. I said, where else can I go and do everything I did on the street and get paid for it? So I went there. And you know what? I love the Marine Corps. The reason why I loved it, because they affirmed me in areas that I thought that I needed to be affirmed in. When they told me to shoot, I shot as straight as I could shoot. When they told me to run, I ran as fast as I could run. When they told me to swim, I swam as best as I could. I loved the Marine Corps. And every time I did something well, they put a medal on my chest. And so this was the love that I thought I needed, but it really wasn't the love that I needed. It was like this fake love. It was like this manufactured love. If you perform, I'll give you an award. Oh, man, we need to preach about that just a little bit, too. Watch this. For years, I lived a life that was performance-based. What do you mean by that, performance-based? That means the only time that I was accepted is when I did well. And it's good, but I started manufacturing my brain based on, based on that. And I, thought, I started thinking, God thinks of me the same way. If I do good things, he will love me. And that's not the way God operates. And so I lived this life. Here I am in my basic school, and that's my beautiful wife, Luana, and we were married for, we've been married for 26 years, and, and the Lord's been doing incredible things to our marriage. Amen. That's right. Amen. And as I start going through the Marine Corps and just doing all these different things, start going to different battles, how many people know if your mindset never changes, even though you change locations, you're still the same person. I was not saved. I didn't know Jesus Christ. My mom always took me to church, and I said, if I ever get away from this place, I am never going back to church again. 
And so I started getting into a lot of trouble. As a matter of fact, if anybody is familiar with a court-martial, I almost got court-martialed in the Marine Corps. And I kept doing things and doing things and doing things. And I had my first sergeant call me up and he says, hey, he said, I've heard about you. I've heard about your life. I heard about the people that you're hanging around with. He said, if you don't stop hanging around with these people, he said, you're going to jail. And so as a young person, I said, hey, I just hang with some different people. I'll do some different things and I'll get out of it. Two weeks went by. He called me back again and he said, stand at attention. So I stood at attention in front of his desk. And he started reading me my rights. He said, you got the right to remain silent. Anything you can to say will be used against you in the court of law. And I said, wait a minute. You don't have to say this. He said, no, I do. He said, because people like you never learn until you have to face the consequences. Here it is, more pressure. Just this pressure. And so after a while, I went back to my barracks room there in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. And I thought about three things. I'm just going to be honest with you. The first thing I thought about was running away. I said, because the pressure is so great to perform, to make sure that I'm doing well by my parents, I'm just going to run away. Now, I thought about it. I said, I can't run away because I don't have that much money. I won't get that far. <laughs> the second thing I thought about uh, was committing suicide. I said, the pressure is just too much. This is, let me, let me give you, this is what the enemy does. He will take you right to the edge. He'll tell you how great things are, but then he'll get to the edge and then he'll back away and say, just jump. Nobody loves you anyway. And that's exactly what it did for me. But then the third thing I thought about was something that my mother had always told me. She said, son, the day that you hear the Lord's voice, don't harden your heart. Give your life to Jesus. And right there in that barracks room, 8th Street in North Carolina, I got on my knees. And I said, God, if you're real. You see, because at that moment, I just, I didn't know if God was really real. I just knew of this God my mother had talked about. And I got on my knees and I said, God, if you're really real. I need to know right now, because if you don't, I'm about to lose it. And you know how Scripture talks about this, this, this peace of God that surpasses all understanding? Right there in that room, it seemed like the God of heaven visited me right there on that day. So I got up. Business as usual, start doing what I need to do, and a couple weeks later, I'm in a Walmart parking lot of all places. And now listen, I grew up in the hood, so I, I, you know, I'm not scared of people. When I walk in the parking lot, I'm like, hey, you know. So I see these three guys walking toward me, and these guys are walking. He says, hey, let me talk to you. I said, all right. He says, hey, have you ever heard or given your life to Jesus Christ? I said, I haven't, but I need to. And right there in that Walmart parking lot, I gave my life to Jesus. Mm. I tell people, you can get anything at Walmart. Jesus is like on aisle five, row 10. And from that moment on, God changed my life. I am not, listen, I am not joking. He literally changed every fiber of my life through the gospel. I, listen, I am a proud product of public education. I, grad, I had the best 13 years in high school, okay? I was not college material. I was not high school material. I spent my life having fun in high school, and God says, I'm going to redeem the time. Everything that, that the enemy meant for you for bad, I'm going to use it for good. So God, in his infinite wisdom, he calls this lady to our base. And this lady comes. She says, are you Corporal Bevel? I said, yes, ma'am, I am. She says, hey, I want to tell you something. She says, I heard about your situation. I heard about you almost getting court-martialed. She says, I'm here to tell you that we're getting ready to move you to Japan. We're going to take you out of this space. 
We're going to put you with some other men. They're going to show you about reading the Bible, show you about being a man of God. And God did it. And it was almost like God was saying, I've got somewhere for you to go, and you don't have time to waste. So now, after I get to Japan, after almost court-martialing me, the Marine Corps says, hey, you are great leadership material. They sent me to college, to the University of Memphis, and I got a a degree in, in, in computer engineering, of all things. I'm walking through the college laughing because I'm like, I shouldn't be here. This is crazy. But it wasn't me. It was God. He says, I'm going to take you. And I'm going to use you for my glory. So I do that. I go to the Marine Corps. I I mean, I go to college and do that and come back. And I get a master's degree and I become an officer. And, man, just things are just just going crazy. I mean, it is going, it is phenomenal. So now I'm here in Monterey and I'm, I'm praying. And this girl walks in. She says, hey, we need to pray for this church in Albany, Georgia. They're making a movie. I was like, a church is making a movie? This is crazy. So we start praying for this church, and I get moved. Guess where I moved to? Albany, Georgia. And I go to this church, and I said, what are you guys doing? They said, we make movies. I said, you make movies? And they start telling me the synopsis, and I'm thinking to myself as they're telling me the synopsis, I am not watching these movies. Christian movies are bad acting and bad quality. But I take them home, and I start watching them, and God is changing my life through a movie. Phenomenal. So they say, hey, they start talking about, we're going to shoot another movie. And the name of this movie is called Fireproof. And and we're going to have, you know, firemen just running in and out of burning buildings. And I'm like, I'm a Marine. That's right up my alley. Burning buildings, fighting, that's right up my alley. I was like, yes, this is great. My wife is like, be quiet. They were trying to give us a synopsis of the movie. After they finished the synopsis, one of the directors walked up to me. He says, hey, I know you just arrived here. Would you mind trying out for one of our movies? Fireproof. I looked at my wife. I thought about it. I said, let me pray about it. I tried out for the movie, did terrible and terrible in auditions. I was laughing the whole time because I just couldn't believe that God allowed me to do something, just audition for a movie. And they called me back in and they said, Ken, we're not going to, we're not going to cast you because you're a good actor. I said, oh, that, that, that's obvious. <laughs> you're not going to do that. They said, but we believe that God has chosen you to be the person in this movie. And that's how I got involved in acting. Besides being a tree in a preschool play, that is as much acting experience I have ever had. It would be like, it would be like, who's, who plays football in here? Football, football player, quarterback. Oh yeah, okay, good deal. It would be like the Super Bowl is happening next week. Our quarterback is out. And we want you to be the starting quarterback of the, of the Super Bowl. You know, I was like, God, I am not equipped for this. I'm not prepared. He says, I know you're not, but I am. And God uses those movies for his glory. Wow. When I look back over my life, I start thinking to myself, I said, how God, how could you ever use a guy like me for anything. And some of you may be thinking about yourself, and sometimes you start, you get, you get focused on your own deficiencies. But guess what? I don't know what degree God desires to use you, but he desires to use you as well for his glory. Some of you, it may be local missions. Some of you, it may be overseas, but God desires to use you. And when I think about this, I think about Romans 12. Here is, here is Paul talking to the Romans, and he's saying, hey, you have been grafted in. And when I think about this grafting in, I'm like, God, you didn't have to do this, but you did it. You did it for them, and God, you've also did it for me. You have grafted me in. I was a Gentile. I was a person who was far away from you. But God, you brought me in. And did a phenomenal work in and through my life, not just for Ken, but God for your glory. And so at this moment, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. If you have a device, you can go on your device and pull it up on your device. Or if you have your Bible, I would love for you to turn there. Because here it is. 
Paul is talking to the Romans. He's talking to the Gentiles that are in Rome. And as he's talking to these Gentiles that are in Rome, he starts, they start talking about in, in chapter 11 how they are grateful that they have been grafted in. And, and because of the Israelites, something must have went wrong. And, 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 and so now they're in now God's good graces. And Paul reminds them. He says, not because of you. He says, because of God's kindness and God's mercy, you have been grafted in. And so in Romans 12, Paul says, because of this, here it is, because of this, this is how you should live your life. So now, how does this apply to today? How does this apply to our lives today? Well, it applies because if you are saved, if you have confessed the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, now God requires of you that you live a life that is pleasing unto him a life that is glorifying him in every single way. So here it is. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. This word brethren means those that are walking in obedience to the word that's being spoken. To present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual act of service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is perfect or good and acceptable and perfect. And this is what we have to do. Now, how does that really kind of coincide with the pressure? What he's saying is that, listen, you have been saved by grace, but we know that there are pressures of life that are closing in on your life. And so with these pressures, how am I supposed to live? And here it is. Number one, you've got to remember what he saved you from. You see, some people listen to my testimony like, man, I wish, you know, I wish God would have radically saved my life. It doesn't matter. If he saved you, we're all inheriting the same kingdom. Amen? We are all all children of God. When we have accepted him as our personal Lord and Savior, we all have an inheritance that is waiting for us. It does not matter how he called you or from what situation he called you from, he called you. And that makes you a child of God. And so when I remember what he saved me from, it reminds me of Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. And here's what it reads. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established, steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was a minister. And as I, read, and as I read this, I started thinking about my own life. I was alienated from God. Matter of fact, in some places of Scripture, it says I was an enemy of God. And so I don't know where you are today or where your life is today. But the first thing you have to do is when you're in, involved in the pressures of life, you have to start remembering God where did you bring me from? Or, God, where do I need to go? The pressures of life should cause me to remember where he saved me from. The second thing that I need to do is I need to, to, humble, to be in humble submission to present my body unto God. In humble submission, present my body unto God. Well, Pastor Ken, how do you humbly submit your body to God? Well, when I talk about humble submission, when I say presenting, it means to bring things or sacrifices that are consecrated specifically and exclusively for God to use. I'm taking something of great value and I'm placing it in the hands of someone else. And so God, for our lives, we should be like, God, what do you want from me? And our lives is almost like this bottle of water. And I take this bottle, 
And I kneel and I say, God, can you take my life? Take it and use it as you please. And sometimes this is difficult because you have other plans. You are thinking about other things, and I've got this plan for my life. But the plan should be, God, will you take my life and use it for your glory? That is the only way, ladies and gentlemen, you will be able to succumb or not to succumb to the pressures of life. If I take my life and I say, Lord, my life is in your hands, take it and do with it as you please. Now, when I look at this also, this scripture, he says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice uh, holy and acceptable unto God. This living sacrifice. When you look in Scripture, specifically in Leviticus, you'll see people putting sacrifices on. He says, I want you to present your body as a living sacrifice. I want you to take you with Jesus in you and put it up as a sacrifice unto God. A living sacrifice that is holy, set apart for God's use, and acceptable unto God for his service. That's our, that's our desire. Third thing. Do not conform to the ways of the world. Do not conform to the ways of the world. When I'm hearing about the pressures of life, and I'm hearing about the things that people are doing, sometimes what will happen is, the picture of that is, this balloon is you. And the world tries to conform you. They're trying to put you inside of something that doesn't fit. And when I think about our lives, that's what the world is doing. They're saying, hey, you don't look like the world does. You don't look like this. In order to make you look like this, we've got to press your life inside of something that doesn't look like you. And here's the problem. Am I going to bust it? They're thinking, like, he's going to bust it. Now, I'm going to tell you what's happening here. As I'm putting this balloon inside of the cup, something's happening to the balloon. What's happening? What? Say it again. It's losing air. Watch this. That's what happens when the world starts conforming you. The things on the inside start moving away as it tries to conform you to his image. You need to look like this. You need to dress like this. You need to sound like this. And it continues to conform you to its image. And sometimes as it's conforming you, people can't take the pressure. And they ultimately pop. But this is the world. It continues to mold you into its image. Do you see this? When we first looked at this balloon, he was like, there is no way he's going to get that balloon in there. But over time, as I continue to press it, add pressure, what happened? It started going inside the cup. You know why? Because that's the same exact thing that the devil desires to do with your life. That's what he does in my life. He continues to press, to conform you into the image of the world. But the Bible says, don't be conformed to this world. It says, be what? Transformed by the renewing of your minds. And I'll tell you, here's the funny thing about this. You'll go through life, and the world tries to conform you to his image, and they'll try to put you in this cup. But then also, if you're not careful... This is, this is the sneaky thing about the world. 
he's got another balloon. He's like, where does this guy get all these balloons from? Here's the other thing. If you're not careful, from a very young age, right about where you're at now, you've learned a little something, you've, you've grown a little bit in the Bible, and so now it's a little harder to get you in that cup. But the devil wants to start early. So what does that mean, Pastor Ken? Why, why did you do that? Well, if I can start you off early, I don't have to conform you to the image of the cup. If I start early, I'll make you live in the cup. And I'll make you think that you belong in the cup. And so it's easier to mold you to the image of the world. Now, watch this. Listen, listen. This happens. The movies you watch, the social media sites you go on to, the things you wear, the images you see, they know most of you, hey, they know most of you go to Shadow Mountain. <laughs> you know, it's going to be a little bit harder to mold them into the image. But if I can get them when they're early, I can blow them up inside the cup, make them think it's normal in the cup. But the Bible tells us, don't be conformed to the ways of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So let's look at what does this mean when it talks about this transformation that needs to take place. You'll see multiple scriptures up on the screen. It says, but now I come to you in these things. I speak in the world so they may have joy. May, my joy may be made full in themselves. I have given your, your, them your word. This is what Jesus is saying. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. But I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. And so now how do I do that? Here are some practical ways to not be conformed. All right. I don't know if you guys can see this. Now, limit your exposure to carnal things. Limit your exposure to carnal things. What do you mean by that? The things I listen to, the things I read, the movies I watch, I've got to limit my exposure. If I don't want to be transformed into the image of the world, I've got to limit my exposure to the things I'm watching. Watch this. Not only that, if you've got social media accounts, turn off notifications. Turn off your notifications. What they're saying is, hey, we're going to contact you when we feel like contacting you. If I turn off my notifications, I silence the things that are going in my ear, and I'm listening more to God than I am to the world. Third thing, remove apps. You know, I had, a, I had an app on my phone, and every time I would get something, it would notify me, so I turned, that, I turned the notifications off. But then after that, every time I opened my phone up, the app was like right there on the front page, so I deleted the app. And I decided to go to the app through the website, which makes it a little bit harder. And it doesn't have access. And I can't be looking at it all day. And so this is one of the things that I've done to make sure I am not conformed with, to the world. Does that make sense, everybody? Limit your exposure. Turn off notification. Remove apps. Set time limits. If you got social media accounts, you're saying, hey, I'm on this way too much. You know, if you're spending three, four hours scrolling and you're just, you know, you're just walking through time, hey, I need to make sure I set some time limits. Establish boundaries. Get some godly accountability partners. Someone of a, a, the same sex who can help you monitor your social media. Now, you may be looking at me like, Pastor Ken, there is no way I'm doing this. The question is going to be, what do you want to be? You want to be conformed in his image? Or you want to be cool? Well, I got, I've got a life just like everybody else. You do. And God gives us things for his good and his glory. But be careful. Because the enemy has a desire to mold you into his image. Next slide. It says, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
This word transformed means it has an, it needs to be an inward change that affects the outward appearance. This inward change that affects the outward appearance. And that outward appearance also means the moral character for the better. And how do you do that? If you go to the next slide, it'll tell us, this, this tells us how to do it. It says, God's word is the catalyst for this inward change. I see a lot of people, and I counsel a lot of people on a daily basis, and they say, you know what, I'm just going to do better. I'm just going to be a better person. You can't be better. Your sinful nature is to commit sin. (laughs) That's what it is. And so what I've got to do, God's Word has got to be the catalyst for the change in my life. And so 2 Timothy talks about the purpose of the Word and how All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching and for reproof and for correction and training in righteousness so that the man of God can be adequately equipped for every good work. If you want to change your life and not be conformed to the image of the world, I've got to start with the Word of God. As I continue to read the, God, read the Word of God, I've got to understand not, I, you know, I hear some people say, well, you know, I just want to love for God's Word, and that's good. But when you know the depth of God's love for you, and you realize what He saved you from, you said, I don't want to just know the Bible. I want to know the God of the Bible, and He will give me and show me His love for me. Inside of that scripture, it talks about this Ephesians 3, 18 through 19. It says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, for whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of God's love for us. That's what he desires. He doesn't want you to just know the Bible. He wants you to know the God of the Bible. James chapter 1, verse 21 and 22, it talks about us being hearers and doers of the word. Not only hearing the word, but also being doers of the word. I'm coming to church every day. I'm coming to a Christian school, and I have Bible, and I'm listening to this, this Bible every day. But God says, hey, listen, I don't want you to just listen to this. I want you to put this in application throughout your daily life. The next thing, the last thing, there is an application to this. And I know, listen, I know this is Shadow Mountain, and so you guys get incredible teaching, incredible teaching. But sometimes I will hear something, it will go in one ear and right out the other. And so this practical application is reiterating things that you've already learned. Listen to this. If I want to make sure I am not conformed to this world and that I am transformed by the renewing of my mind, there's got to be an established time for devotion. Established time for devotion. Here it is. If I'm spending four hours on social media every day, I'm hanging out with my friends probably another five hours. I'm eating in between time. I'm sleeping in between time. I'm spending time with my family. And I'm spending 30 minutes in God's word every day. Who do you think is going to have the most control over you? It won't be God's word. And so I've got to spend time every day being intentional about, Lord, help me to grow. Pray for his wisdom as you read his word. God, help me to learn what you're saying, not just for checking the box every morning. Hey, I did my devotional. Hey, it was good. And, you know, but God, help me to understand your word. It is more about the quality of time rather than the quantity of time. Read from a point of understanding. Read from a point of understanding. God, I want to understand this, not just know it. Memorizing verses of Scripture. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. These are some practical ways that I can continue to ensure that I'm not conformed to this world, but I am transformed by the renewing of my mind. Journal special points. If you're reading through your devotional in the morning and you're seeing that, man, you know, God's giving me some sweet time of devotion here, start writing down and journaling, okay, man, this is good for remembrance could be something that God is placing on your heart for later. 
And then later, the last one, to ensure that I, I, I understand the Word of God, I start sharing it with other people. I start sharing it with other people. Now, the end of that verse it so says, so that you may prove, which is to test or examine what the will of God is. And his will is good, acceptable, and perfect. As I prepare to close, some people look at the Bible, and I used to be one of those people. I can't deny it. I used to look at the Bible and say, man, it's just a big bunch of rules that I just I can't keep. This keeps me from doing all the fun things in my life. This, this book, it tells me what I, it's like a big book of this is what you should not do. But the reality is God's word for us is what he desires for us to know what is good, acceptable, and perfect. And not just to know them, but to walk in them. I would give anything, I would give anything to be back in the position you're in today and then accept Christ as my Lord and Savior at an early age. Wow. God wants to do so much in and through your life. Matter of fact, the Bible says, eyes have not seen, nor have ears heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men what God has prepared for those who love him. If at this moment you are looking at your life and you have been experiencing this tremendous amount of pressure, a pressure to become something other than what God describes in the Bible, I'm going to tell you today you don't have to live like that. Now, pressures will come, yes, absolutely, but when I'm in Christ, he shows me, this is how you handle this. This is how you walk through this. No, you don't have to go this way. This is the way to go. This is the way, walk in it. And ladies and gentlemen, when you get to the end of your life, you'll look back and you say, I have no regrets because I have followed the Lord wholeheartedly not succumb to the pressures of life. But I've said, Lord, here's my life. I don't want to be conformed into the image of this world, but Lord, would you transform my heart? And I guarantee you, it'll be sweeter. I look at my life now and I tell people as I close, I wish the only regret I have in life, I feel like I've lived like three lives already, but the only regret I have in my life is that I didn't give my life to Jesus much, much sooner, much, much sooner. Because he has done great things. Same thing you just saying, but do you believe it? Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning. God, thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your word. God, I know without a shadow of a doubt, there are multiple young people in here. And just like we did this experiment on the balloon, they feel a tremendous amount of pressure. Pressure from home, pressure from school, pressure from friends, pressure, just pressure from all over the place. And almost, it almost seems unbearable. But God, I pray, if they're in Christ, I pray that today they will find strength, help, and comfort in you. That their lives are not conformed to the image of this world, but Lord, they are transformed through the renewing of their minds. Help them to understand who they are in you. And God, for the ones that are here and have not accepted Christ, I pray that today will be their day. I pray that they will submit themselves to Jesus Christ fully and completely. Because God, in you, you give us the strength to carry on. Yes, there is a promise of eternity, but Lord, why, even while we're here on earth, we get to live in those promises of Jesus. And so, Lord, would you do an incredible work in the hearts and minds of the students here. Father, thank you for the leadership of this church. Continue to use them as a catalyst for seeing people saved all around the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
And just like that, the 2023 chapel season came to a close. Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? That's y'all's last chapel this year. You guys remember when you sat in here at the beginning of the year and you thought, oh, man, we got a whole school year ahead of us. Look at you now. You got a couple days, just a few days for your seniors, the whole real world talk that y'all been saying for four years. Just about welcome to it, huh? That's kind of wild. Yeah, you go. we go from laughing about things to paying taxes real soon, so good luck with it. But, hey, since we're, before we, before we leave out, man, I think one of the things that you'll notice is in, in a lot of classrooms, in small groups, from, cha- from uh, chapels, from pastors, whatever, is you'll hear this application point of read your Bible, and it's easy to go, well, we've heard this, right? It's interesting how so many of these sins that we can struggle with or whatever it is, there's a scripture that addresses it, right? And what, he's, what Ken was putting on the screen and explaining for you guys is as simple as God's plan for you. And seniors, please tell me, all the time that you spent in church and small groups, in chapels, at Christian high, in Bible classes, whatever it is, please tell me, it hasn't been for nothing, Right? Please tell yourself that at least, that you've, you're at least going to go out of here and begin these habits of spending time with God. Because, man, Dr. J puts it this way often, is it's not all about getting you in the Word. It's not only about getting your mind in the Word, but it's about getting the Word in your mind, right? And it's really hard to have one without the other. It's really hard to make decisions based on God's Word if you don't have time based on God's Word. And I can tell you it's not just corporate like this. Corporate worship is so important, and we're going to have a whole bunch of it tonight in youth group. But before any of that, man, even when you guys get out and you get away from Bible class where you're, you, you, know, you get grade-based Bible memory or whatever it is, you have somebody challenging you that way, one of the incredible markers of being a Christian is enjoying time with the Lord. Enjoying time with the Lord. I can tell you, if we sat, sit down and you're watching your clock the whole time, I can tell you God doesn't want that. God doesn't want it to be, gosh, do I have 10 more minutes with him? God wants you to enjoy that time with him. Now, i got this challenge for you guys. Will you do what Ken said is carve out time, even in the summer, not for a grade, but so that your mind will be renewed. Will y'all please take that challenge on as we leave here? Will you do it? Can we just get a uh huh? I got uh, an announcement for our seniors, and I got an announcement for every high schooler, and then I got an announcement for middle schoolers. Middle schoolers, say yeah. yeah. Middle schoolers, I got a text from Pastor Chase. Tonight they are doing a broomball tournament. I hope you know what that means because I don't totally understand, but he has also given away a trip to Hume for middle school. Uh, high schoolers, hey, I know we just got 300 of y'all back from the river trip. Uh, I want to see every single person, whether you went to River Trip or whether you didn't, I want y'all to know everybody is invited to worship God tonight at 615 in the high school ministry. It's going to be a blast. Small groups are back. And then seniors say, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it sounds like a senioritis. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, seniors, you guys, not only are you going to worship with us tonight, but y'all are going to hang back because somebody's got something for you. So hang back after we pray out of here, and then uh, I I imagine Miss Breeden's got something for you. No, she doesn't. She doesn't. All right, but y'all are going to hang out. We'll we'll, we'll figure out what that is. No, you Whatever. Mrs. Lance said y'all are staying back. So God, pray that the seniors would figure it out, whatever it is. Lord, we're grateful that when you command us to be renewed, God, that you give us a path for it. God, thank you so much that when you command us to live life your way, that you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross to cover our sins, to make it possible for us to live your way, that you send your Holy Spirit as a helper, in the words of your son Jesus, to help us live the way you create us to live. God, thank you that you don't give us empty words or empty commands, but every single thing that you call us to do, you also come alongside to help us do that as well. God, as we all take that next step of obedience out of here right now, would you help us to take it in faith? 
Would you help us to take that step in obedience following you with all of our lives, Jesus? And we all pray it in your name. Amen. Amen. Seniors, don't forget. Y'all hang out. Stay back. Y'all can convene up front. Let's call it that. Seniors, convene up front.